Okay, welcome to R for Data Science at Carnegie Mellon's Heinz College. I am this guy, John Ostland, and I'll be your tour guide through R for Data Science, uh, particularly the, the tidy verse is what we're going to be concentrating on uh, over the course of these next seven weeks. Now, for obvious reasons, uh, I will not be able to physically see you during the course, um, for which I apologize. I will uh, endeavor to show you what I look like at some point here, but I have to clean up a bit of my office behind my camera in order to feel comfortable doing that. Uh, my, my office is a rat's nest, what can I tell you? Um, I will be ably assisted during the course by... Shihan and Max, my two teaching assistants, uh, teaching assistants, they will for the most part be helping me with grading uh, homework assignments as quizzes. Uh, when I wrote this syllabus, I said that they might hold office hours. I suspect that that uh, they will not be holding physical office hours, but they will be holding virtual office hours. I do want to make clear that I'm available more or less all the time. Uh, I tend to be at my system around 9 in the morning and stick around working on things until around 9 o'clock in the evening. Actually, as I'm recording this, it's 10 after 9, so, so today I'm here even later. I try to respond to students' questions and comments very rapidly. If you uh, send me a question that's, that's too late, it won't be till the next day for sure. And if I have some pressing time commitment going on, it, it may not be until the next day that you send me the question. But uh, I certainly will get back to you within 24 hours, and I try to get back to people much sooner than that. I did want to just mention something about grading here. Uh, I've received some questions about that. 20% of your course grade will be based on your homework performance. We will have homework on a weekly basis. And I expect people to work on homework with a partner. In fact, I will be assigning you each randomly a partner for the first homework assignment and then changing the random assignment from week to week. Now, I do not expect or even desire for you to work with each other side by side on the homework assignments but what I do expect is that you will each do the homework assignment independently and then after you've finished compare what you've done with what your partner did to see whether you have different ideas about how certain things should have been approached or perhaps one of you has a better idea about a certain problem than than the other hopefully you'll be able to gain ideas from each other by looking at each other's solutions to problems I'm, I'm not a big believer in people working on code in isolation. That's just not that's just not how things are in real life. So uh, within each team, mostly the teams will be two people. Depending on the number of students, there might be a, one team with three. Within each team, you will have to decide between yourselves which one of your homeworks you're going to submit to Canvas. 30% of your course grade will be based on bi-weekly quizzes. The quizzes will be somewhere between 30 and 40 minutes. And since we only had one class period here during week one, the quizzes will occur during weeks three, five, and seven on Wednesdays. And I'll have more to say about the quizzes as we go along. Generally, the quizzes are open book, open system. You can use pretty much any resources that you want. However, there is a time limit, so don't rely on just looking stuff up on the web during the quiz. You do have to know the material quite well in order to be able to finish within the time that's available for the quiz. Half of your course grade will be based on a final project and my teaching assistants and I have been debating a little bit about how to approach this. 
Generally, we like to have teams of four or five people working on final projects. Um, but under the current circumstances, that's not really realistic. I also considered briefly having each individual person do a final project, but I think that's also not, not really appropriate um, because I do want you to do something that's substantial. So what I'm going to do is to divide everybody up with uh, just one or possibly two uh, partners and ask you to work on final projects as, as part of uh, pairs or trios. Now, I realize that during the course of the upcoming weeks, uh, we may have some people drop out of the course and other people from the waitlist come into the course. So we will have to juggle the memberships of these fi final project teams a little bit over the course of the few weeks. But that's okay. We won't we won't really know enough for at least the first couple of weeks to be able to get started on these final projects anyway. So we'll wait a couple of weeks for the course population to stabilize a little bit, and then I'll get into more details about this final project. This is not material that lends itself very well to a final exam. Most of what we're going to be doing is exploratory in nature and requires you to gather information, clean that information, or in the tidyverse terminology, tidy the information, and then do exploratory analysis of the information, including displaying visualizations and so forth. And you, and you really have to do this. I mean, you, you know, there's no, uh, there's no, uh, th there isn't really any particular way that I can just put an exam together saying, you know, use this particular plotting function and see what you get. Um, so we, we are going to be doing these final projects. However, again, because of the circumstances that we are all currently living under, I am open to suggestions. We will change the rules as necessary. You're all aware, I have no doubt, of the policy saying that you can choose to change your course grade to a pass-fail basis even after the course is over. So I hope you'll bear with me and do your very best work with your one or two partners to produce a good final project and hopefully be happy with the grade that you get and if not you can <laughs> change it to a pass um, unless you succeed in doing really horrible work or no work at all i will assure you that it's not very likely that anybody's going to fail um, this is extremely valuable knowledge to have, extremely valuable in information to have. It is very well worth your while, grade or no grade. And so I hope and expect that everybody will do their best to, to learn the material that we're going through. All right, well, that got to be a bit longer than I had planned. Let us actually look at the notes here. So we're going to be using the so-called tidyverse collection of packages developed in R for talking about and doing tasks of data science. There are certainly lots of other ways of you know doing data science using uh, other tools or older tools or what have you, but the tidyverse is very well and very cleanly structured and very well thought out, so we're going to use it as a focus, if you will, for our uh, discussions here. All right. Now, so what is data science anyway? Well, the term data science originated, I don't know, a dozen years ago or, or thereabouts at a time when 
machine learning was rapidly gaining interest and uh, popularity and people realized at various companies that they had this huge amount of data that they didn't really know what to do with. Um, everybody was hooked up to the internet, everybody was collecting all kinds of data. An awful lot of people, an awful lot of companies were merely collecting the data and not really using it for uh, anything. Um, at the time that the term first started being tossed around, I was working in a machine learning research lab in the Robotics Institute, an uh, outfit called the Auton Lab. And we knew, for example, that a, a, a <laughs> let's say, a large regional grocery store chain was gathering huge amounts of information about its customers based on, how shall I put this, the uh, uh, the customer loyalty cards that, that people were carrying around. And they were doing exactly nothing with any of that data. <laughs> which, which, uh, which was both amusing and horrifying. Um, anyway, so, so the idea of data science is to try to do something useful with all of this data that people have uh, lying around. That is, we're going to try to uh, one way this has been described is uh, extracting knowledge from data. That's both kind of descriptive and also totally general, so you can <laughs> interpret that however you want. Uh, there was also early on an emphasis on dealing with massive amounts of data, but dealing with massive amounts of data is, is really only one task it's sort of a subtask of some kinds of data science. The, the real main thrust of data science is to try to gain understanding of the data that you have. And by looking at the data and running the data through models and visualizing the data, try to come up with interesting ideas about how you could improve the operation of a business or how you could improve delivery of services to some uh, population or, or what have you. Ideally, you really need to be an expert programmer, an expert statistician, and also an expert at presenting your results to people in order to be a data scientist. Now, that's a, that's a pretty tall order, but that is more or less the goal. Now, Really, just over the course of the last 20 years, there's been a pretty dramatic shift in how uh, people have dealt with data. Uh, back in the good old days, when I was a young'un, uh, data was hard to come by, actually. It was it, very expensive to gather data. Uh, computers weren't, well, computers were very expensive and centralized. Networks, by and large, didn't exist. And so, if you were a statistician in a big organization, it was typically your job to do what's called experimental design to, uh, in, in response to particular questions that the leaders or the managers uh, had within the organization that you were working with. Uh, what is it that causes our customers to buy more watermelons? What can we do to ensure that we have, well, face masks uh, where we need them to be, et cetera, et cetera. And you would have to come up as a, as a statistician handling these kinds of problems with some kind of implementable way of collecting the data that you needed to answer that particular question uh, and then analyze the data and see whether you could come to some statistically significant worthwhile conclusions. Times have changed, as I, as I sort of implied. Now, data is all over the place, and what people have trouble with is figuring out even what questions to ask with the data that, that they have. Okay, so the job of a data scientist 
is really to rummage around through all of the data that companies and organizations have and try to come up with interesting questions that hopefully the, the data can, can answer that will be of value to uh, the organization in some way. It's also very important that the data scientist be able to communicate with customers slash clients slash bosses who are typically much less technical than the data scientist uh, him or herself. It's not useful to develop statistically significant results if you can't then explain those to whoever it is that you're working for and persuade them to, uh, you know, to take certain actions. Okay, so as I said at the outset here, we're going to concentrate on something called the Tidyverse, which is a collection of packages uh, largely driven by this fellow named uh, Hadley Wickham, uh, who is uh, employed by RStudio, along with some other quite high-powered folks. Uh, these are packages developed for R, and so through a combination of just plain old R language capabilities um, and these tools, you can handle the complete sort of life cycle of a data science project. All right, and here, rather than trying to recreate something similar myself, uh, I have just directly stolen a very useful diagram from uh, the R for Data Science book. Basically, the sequence of steps involved in doing a data science project is to first import data from some source. Now, actually, even before that, you may have to locate uh, data of interest uh, from some distant source, you know, like uh, you know, customer information or crime information or stock market information or what have you, uh, and then import or ingest that uh, into your R system, uh, tidy the data up, and then iterate through this cycle of transforming the data into various interesting subsets or slices uh, and visualizing and modeling, uh, visualizing and modeling that transformed information. Once you have found some interesting results, it's then also your job as the data scientist to communicate with the end users, boss, client, customer, what have you, uh, what it is that you found and suggest, su suggest how that information can be used to, to help the organization. Okay, so obviously we need some data, but that's generally not a problem nowadays because, you know, we've got the web, we've got uh, customer transaction information, we've got uh, website click information. Depending on what our organization is, we typically have reams and reams and reams of, of data, so that's not a problem. We need to import that data into a form that we can use in R, and that will typically either be from uh, files that you have on disk, or from database systems, or through web port uh, API connections or some combination of all of these. And when you import the data, you want to get that data into R's conventional data structure, standard data structure for dealing with uh, data that you want to work with, the, namely the, the data frame. Loosely speaking, a data frame is sort of like a spreadsheet-ish data structure that has rows and columns that are labeled. Now, once you have done your importation, the next step, if we're following the tidyverse methodology, is to tidy the data. And basically what that means is to structure all of your data frames in such a way the each column of the data frame represents some kind of random variable of interest, and each row in the data frame 
is a particular observation. Data frames, of course, are not required to be organized in this, in this way, so that each column is a variable and each row is an observation. But the, or an emphasis within the tidyverse is, look, if you have different data frames that are structured in different not too compatible ways, then rather than concentrating on exploring and analyzing and displaying the data, you will instead be absorbed in writing code to force these incompatible things to be compatible. All right, so Wickham's argument in the tidyverse is, look, just, just don't allow yourself to deal with these incompatible kinds of data frames. Force the data frames all to have the same organization where each column in the data frame represents a random variable and each row is a particular observation. Okay, so like, for example, we might have patients in a doctor's office where the columns represent things like uh, age, gender, height, weight, uh, history of heart trouble, history of cancer, history of this or that. And the observations then are one row for each patient within the doctor's office. Okay? Now, so we are, within this tidyverse framework, only dealing with rectangular data. This means that we're not going to try to deal with things, you know, graphs like, like social networks or web link networks or anything like that. We're also not going to be trying to deal with uh, images or sounds or speech or text. And we're also, within the tidyverse framework, not really dealing with big data. Big data is a sort of a subspecialty that you need to use for some kinds of data science. Um, and one way of dealing with big data, frankly, is to subset it in such a way that you have a lot of different smaller data sets rather than a single giant uh, data set. And that's often uh, possible to do in, in various ways. So we're going to be dealing with uh, moderately sized rectangular data in our exploration here of uh, data science. Okay, once you have got all of your data tidied, then you can perform various kinds of transformations on the data. For example, uh, if you, again, let's suppose that we had patients in a doctor's office in one of our data frames, we might transform the data by saying, okay, I only want to look at males between the ages of 20 and 50. All right, so, so in that case, what we've done is we've, we've narrowed down the data that we're working with to just a certain subset of rows. Similarly, you might also say, okay, well, for this analysis, I don't really care about the height or the weight of the patient. I only care about the age and the uh, heart disease, uh, you know, history of heart disease, yes or no. That kind of thing. So in, there, in that case, we're constraining on columns. It's also very often useful to create things like ratios between the different columns. For example, if we have patients' heights and weights, we might be interested in having another derived variable that kept track of the ratio of weight to height or height to weight. Now, these two steps taken together, the, the tidying and the transforming, are, at least in tidyverse terminology, what you hear uh, referred to as wrangling the data, that is, uh, <laughs> uh, flogging the data into shape so that it behaves, uh, that it's, it behaves nicely for you, all right? So if you, if you can uh, handle the business of tidying and transforming data, uh, you, can, you can claim that you're a data wrangler, which, I don't know, might impress someone who's interviewing you. Um, okay. Now, once we have gotten 
<clears throat> our data uh, sort of minimally transformed. In particular, perhaps we've uh, created some derived variables and created certain subsets of rows and columns. We're then ready to do an iterative process to try to understand or explore what's going on with our data to try to come up with some interesting questions uh, to ask and hopefully for which we can provide answers. <clears throat> okay. Now, visualizations are what they sound like. They are pictures, plots that you can look at and hopefully try to draw some useful uh, intuitions from. Visualizations are great, but they don't work on truly massive data sets. If you have a, a scatter plot and you have so much data that your scatter plot just looks like a, a huge amorphous blotch, that's not really going to be very helpful. Okay, so visualization can be really useful depending on how much data you've got. Um, but if visualization won't help you uh, cut through and see what's going on with your data, then applying some kind of statistical or machine learning kind of model might, uh, might help. And typically you'll end up trying kind of both things together. And you'll often create some uh, hypotheses or questions that uh, turn out not to be very interesting or that it doesn't look like you really do have much support for. And so this process just goes around and around and around until eventually one hopes that we can produce some worthwhile uh, hypotheses, some worthwhile questions to ask that we, will, will, that we believe will be uh, helpful to our organization. All right, so visualizing data, uh, well, okay, uh, I guess before I get to that, I do want to point out that, you know, that humans are extraordinarily good at noticing patterns and things. And in fact, in many ways, we're, we're, we're too good at noticing patterns, um, including patterns that are sort of preposterous. Uh, there are, for example, a part of my, part of my life is, uh, working with uh, students in financial computing uh, courses. And although none of our students are this silly, you know, there are people who believe that sunspots have some kind of effect on stock prices, you know, or the, or the moon has effect on stock prices or, you know, goodness knows what. So in statistical analysis, of course, what we're doing much of the time is running tests to determine whether we should reject a certain hypothesis or whether we should accept it. Now, uh, of course, uh, to be uh, strictly correct, I should say, to, to fail to reject certain hypotheses. But that's actually not our focus here. What we're interested in doing is coming up with hypotheses that we think might be interesting to test for the benefit of our organization. All right, so visualization is one tool that we can use for this. And within the tidyverse, a package called ggplot2 provides a very good collection and, in fact, a, a grammar for describing charts of various kinds. And in addition to or instead of visualization, we can run various kinds of models to try to come up with some uh, understanding of what's going on with the data that we have. And this is a cyclic pattern that we just do over and over again to try to come up with interesting descriptions and interesting hypotheses about our data. Okay, well, then the last step, which is in some ways the most important step, is that you have to be able to communicate your ideas, your hypotheses, your questions that you've come up with, from investigating the data to decision makers so that they can decide whether it's worth investigating your ideas uh, further or to implement your suggestions if you have been able to confirm that some of your hypotheses are correct or, or at least not, uh, you know, should not be rejected. 
Now, to me, it's sort of fascinating that this methodology, if you will, for doing data science is very similar to what the Heinz College uh, ideal or motto uh, is. Uh, that is to stand at the intersection of people, policy, and technology. What we're doing here, for sure, is applying technology in the form of data analysis and statistics in order to generate useful information for people who can then make decisions about how to improve what's going on within their organization or within society as a whole. Now, of course, all of these steps in this data science methodology rest on being able to do programming. All right, so programming is a very important skill, a very important thing to, to be able to do. In our case, we're going to be concentrating on R, but you'll almost certainly find, even if R is your primary tool for doing data science projects, that you're also going to need to know some other languages and tools, such as Python, such as uh, powerful text editors, spreadsheets, a variety of other kinds of tools, uh, particularly early on in this, in this uh, methodology. Okay, we started out by saying that, okay, the first step in our data science project uh, methodology is going to be to import the data, by which we mean importing the data into R so that we can tidy it. But often, even before the importation step, uh, there is some uh, data cleaning, data manipulation, data flogging activity that you have to do that may be best done outside of R using uh, blunter and harsher kinds of, uh, kinds of tools. Okay, so, you know, that's, that's of course, uh, uh, up to you. But I, I suggest that knowing a very powerful text editor, knowing how to use things like uh, filters, knowing how to use Python or something like awk or Perl, will enhance your ability to, to bash data around in the early stages so that you can get it to a point where you can import it uh, into R. All right, well, partly because it's a very important tool both for exploring data and also for communicating what you've discovered about the data, we're going to start out with visualization which in the tidyverse means we're going to start out with ggplot2. Okay, um, I'm going to assume for now that we have already gone through the pain and headaches of getting our data, importing it into R, tidying up the data into uh, data frames where the columns are variables and the rows are observations. We've done all of that stuff. And now we want to start exploring the data visually. Okay, so I have got my RStudio application running on the right-hand side of the screen here. And I need to get my Tidyverse library uh, loaded. I am unable... <laughs> <laughs> I am unable to talk and type at the same time. <laughs> so, uh, all right, so here we go. So, library tidyverse. And there we go. All right, so we've got ggplot2 as well as a whole bunch of other things. Now, down here, these conflicts indicate that this package within the tidyverse, uh, dplyr, has its own filter and lag functions that hide the versions in the stats package but but we don't we don't care about that if we if we need to care about that we can always use stats colon colon filter uh, to get the one from the stats package if we need to now happily for us R comes with some built-in uh, what I've described here as toy data frames they're actually legitimate data. They, they were gathered uh, from actual sources. MPG is one such data frame that we can uh, use to experiment with ggplot2. And if you just type 
MPG at the prompt, you can see that it's got 234 records, and these are in a proper tidy structure. That is, the columns here are random variables, the auto manufacturer, the auto model, the auto displacement. Now that's the engine displacement in liters, that is the size of the engine. Then the year the car was produced, the number of cylinders, whether it's an automatic or manual transmission, whether it's four wheel drive, front wheel drive, or rear wheel drive. Okay, so we have F for front wheel, four for four wheel drive, and then we also have some R's in here for rear, rear wheel drive cars. CTY is the city miles per gallon, uh, according to the EPA. So, uh, so the first car gets 18 miles to the gallon in the city. And then following that, there are three more variables that my screen is just too narrow to display. Uh, HWY is the highway miles per gallon. Uh, FL here is the fuel type, gasoline or diesel or... Crisco or whatever it might be, um, and class is the the type of car, whether it's a midsize or a compact or uh, whatever it might be. Okay, so we might be interested in knowing is there in these cars some relationship that's obvious between the mileage that the car gets and the size of the engine we might suspect that the bigger the engine, the lower the mileage, okay? So let us use ggplot2 to determine uh, whether such a relationship exists within this MP MPG uh, data set, data frame. All right, so to create our plot, we start out by saying ggplot and we can indicate what data frame we want the plot to make use of. Now, interestingly, the way that ggplot2 is organized, the plot is separate from the uh, charts or, or graphs or what have you that you put within the, the plot, or technically what you layer on to the plot. So we're going to start by saying ggplot's data is mpg. And then we're going to add a particular kind of plot geometry. Namely, we're going to create a scatter plot. Uh, geometry is point. And in here, we need to do a mapping of aesthetics, so called. And, and this is. Uh, you know, I'm doing this fairly briskly. Uh, this is going to be much better explained when you read through the full documentation in the in the textbook. Um, what I want is my aesthetics to have the displacement on the x-axis and the highway miles per gallon on the y axis. And there we are. And poof. Okay. So here is a scatter plot representing uh, with the displacement in the x axis, the highway miles per gallon uh, corresponding for each of the observations in our data set. And we do see, roughly speaking, that there's a linearish. Uh, decrease in in highway miles per gallon as the displacement in liters uh, increases. Although there's some interesting, uh, you know, outliers here and there that we might be interested in investigating for further. All right, so there we are. I have shown you one plot and your job in homework one is going to be to investigate a whole lot more plots, uh, not only with the MPG data, but with some other uh, data sets as well. 
Okay, um, if you have any questions about anything, if you have any suggestions about anything, if you have any comments about anything, feel free please to send me an email uh, at any time and I will respond as quickly as I am able. Uh, lastly, uh, I, I apologize for being a little bit slow in getting this first lecture posted. I will, I will endeavor to be much prompter with the uh, future weeks. All right, take care.